Hello everyone. If you have been following our research, you will see how the decodings of sacred geometries, mandalas, scriptures, the Nazca lines, geoglyphs, petroglyphs, hieroglyphs, the Book of Enoch, various cultures and belief systems, the research of real world data, those halos in the sky, earthquake data, the mimic map and much much more decode into a technological and mechanical realm, a construct of vast magnitude and magnificence, described and depicted everywhere in our history. The same story of the underworld, the heavens and their workings, repeated over and over no matter where you look. A history and knowledge we seem to have forgot. Pieces of a jigsaw that slot together into one amazing construct and conclusion. There is a creator. In this video you will learn what the stars really are. You will gain a better understanding of Walter Russell's work and hopefully be able to see what it is we see. Bonjour à tout le monde. Cette recherche peut choquer certaines d'entre vous car elle révèle un créateur et la construction de notre terre. Cette recherche n'est pas conçue pour provoquer ni offenser. Il révèle plutôt la gloire de la créateur, ce que nous avons découvert, comment notre monde fonctionne réellement, les décodages des anges et leur véritable identité et finalité nous montrent la voie. Ce sont des technologies conçues par notre Créateur, des technologies qui sont les 144 000 des Écritures. Si elle est ci-dessous et travaillant ensemble pour nous donner nos lumières, nos étoiles errantes et la majeure partie de la nature elle-même, c'est le pouvoir et la gloire que le Créateur nous a donné. Un cadeau d'amour, un cadeau que nous sommes supposés d'embrasser et apprendre comme nos ancêtres. Un cadeau qui nous a enseigné tous un peu partout dans ce domaine, comme le montre ce recherche. Merci. Hello. So today, let's talk about a few little subjects. So, as everyone knows, or has more than likely heard about, the mysterious Bermuda Triangle that's off the coast of Florida. Maybe you've heard of the Nevada Triangle that's in the United States. Area 51's included in this triangle. Maybe, possibly, the Dragon's Triangle that's off the coast of Japan. But, did you know that there's even more of these mysterious triangles? We also have the Malyobka Triangle that's in Russia. We have the Bass Strait that's down by Australia, between Australia and Tasmania. the Masalembo Triangle that's around Indianesia where boats aren't even allowed to travel. We also have a very large anomaly in the South Atlantic Ocean that's between South America and Africa. So, what do all these have in common? Well, they have had massive disappearances where no traces of the people, ships, planes have been found in many of these cases. Upon looking into the areas, well over 3,000 people have gone missing. Not only that, but people have identified these areas as what mainstream calls alien hotspots. There are many 
sightings of out-of-place light anomalies reported and recorded in these areas. These areas have had many theories on what could be going on here, such as electromagnetic disturbances, water vortices, large undersea fields of methane, And there's one theory that even says dragons live beneath the sea. One idea that really stuck out to me that makes a lot of sense is a new theory that's proposed by meteorologists claiming that the reasons for the mysterious pervading the Bermuda Triangle area are unusual hexagonal clouds. These clouds can create winds that run about 170 mile per hour. They're air bombs full of wind. These air pockets cause all the mischief sinking ships and downing different planes. The scientists conclude that some of these clouds could reach 20 to 55 miles across. Not only that, but the storms produced have waves that can reach as high as 45 feet. And what's more, the clouds have straight edges on multiple sides. Some people believe that such phenomenon occur in places where there's underground fractures where strong energy is coming up from the depths of the earth. A fracture is actually a wave duct for electromagnetic energy to come up from the lower layers. There are many effects reported besides odd lights, disappearances, and crazy weather. Some have reported effects of a frozen sound. Others report what they say they hear like a tractor coming. You wait for it to come into view, but it never does, and then the sound subsides. Unexplained booming sounds, whistling over the Pacific, and humming from Britain have yet to be explained by science. So another thing that I was kind of taking a look at is the underground base entrances shown here and I'd like to try to relate this with the mystery sounds heard in different parts of the world as well as with our grid strange sound in Sweden this sure sounds like a trumpet in Michigan another trumpet like sound The entrances are very clearly entry points to get down to the technology that we speak about. Some of the entrances may lead to underground chambers below that contain our angel technologies. Perhaps they're even trying to recover some of the fallen angel technology to learn about the secrets. Loud booms underground would reverberate through the ground be heard on the surface and escape into the sky. Some of the phenomenon causes inexplicable fear. If you're walking along a path and then suddenly people get overwhelmed as if the infrasound or something other than is affecting your brain. This is one of the largest effects of high EMF fields. This is on a scale that we can't even imagine. So there must be something there, either of electromagnetic nature or some unknown objects that we're not aware of. Reports of loud humming sounds occur in many of these locations, along with the strange lights that are seen coming upward from the ground. 
The South Atlantic Anomaly is by far the largest area of the triangles, which is as large as North America, science says. This is an area where the Earth's inner Van Allen radiation belt comes closest to the Earth's surface, dipping down to an altitude of 200 kilometers. This leads to an increased flux of energetic particles in this region and exposes the area to higher than usual levels of radiation. So what the heck does all this mean? Well, we'll have to go back to much of our past research to explain these events. In the past, we've done water currents, we've done caves, obelisks, pyramids, fireballs, ley lines. We've done haunted areas. and particle accelerators. Along with many, many other things. So when we compare to the Nazca lines, these areas fall on dipoles. So what is a dipole? Well, Dipoles are antennas consisting of horizontal metal rods with a connecting wire at the center. Or in chemistry, it's a molecule in which a concentration of positive electric charge is separated from a concentration of negative charge. So, what would this sound like? Well, a dipole can be compared to a tuning fork. We would hear two loud regions in the plane of the times separated by two quiet regions in the plane, perpendicular to the fork. This actually um, this actually explains the weird booming and humming screeching sounds that we hear throughout the world. This, I would say, is the technology we refer to running and humming and grinding underneath the surface to give some of my thoughts on the reports. In these areas, we are seeing the theories we speak of that technologies are running below and projecting up into the heavens as we see our sun, moon, planets, and stars do. As above, so below. The churning of the waters and fierce currents from the cogs turning together below. This also can explain the radiation given off by volcanic activity below the areas as well. If you remember to our Twelve Gates and Wonderland, that volcanoes are the waste and recycle system of all the workings below. All we've learned in the past These areas are of great energy, the energy that the elite have taken as their own and sell back to us daily. The so-called alien lights, well, let's take a look here for a second at FPV's video where he explains these lights and he references back to Tesla's work. Angel Technologies. Let's talk about this as it is very much related to our research. These sites have been reported around the world. Visual spirals and moving projectiles in the heavens which appear to just switch off and vanish. They usually try to say this is a rocket test. Some have correctly associated these with geopetro and hieroglyphs, the depictions everywhere around the world, no matter the country or culture, the exact same depictions. This is ancient knowledge, we were taught these things in days of old, the workings of the realm and how they work in relation to the heavens. 
They also feature heavily in the Nazca lines, which I have been decoding as blueprints through the underworld. Our research has been based upon these blueprint overlays, which can easily be linked to scriptures, the Book of Enoch, other sacred geometries, real world data, earthquakes, volcanoes, and pretty much most of nature's processes. What you may be looking at are projected elements from an open-ended tube, a particle accelerator that can project a particle hundreds of miles. The spiral in part may be coming from an element that is going through the right hand rule, the spin around the particle accelerator. Now my concerns here would be what particle is being projected and what health risks, if any, are there to the public below. We know the sun's element is gold, the moon's is silver, what particles are being used here? Someone really needs to take an air sample from near these events and have them checked out. There will be signs in the skies. Now that sentence should end in if this technology is tampered with or reverse engineered. Now why do I say they are projected particles? Let me take you back to the free FBI Freedom of Information file on Mr. Nikola Tesla. In Exhibit Q here, you can see an agreement between Nikola Tesla and the Antog Trading Corporation, in which Tesla agreed to supply plans, specifications and complete information on a method and apparatus for producing high voltages up to 50 million volts, or producing very small particles in a tube open to air, or increasing the charge of the particles to the full voltage of the higher potential terminal and for projecting the particles to distances of 100 miles or more, the maximum speed of the particles was specified at not less than 350 miles per second. These alien sightings, as we can see, fall on the grid, along the grid, and are very obvious that they are a result of technology and follow the return path of the sun. As we can see in the next comparison, these triangles fall on the vortices and chakras of our world. If you recall, the chakras are the gates as depicted in ancient Egyptian text, which we decoded to be the return path of the sun from the shutoff point in the west to the start in the east gates. All of these anomalies are explained from the direct energy below. I know all this info is repeated a lot, but as we look into new things, we discover they are all related to the workings of the realm. The fact that spots don't change is key in the fact that the technology is where it has always been. This is what we are showing you with each new related discovery. We give explanation that all relates to one another, and it's due to the angel text below on a scale that we can't comprehend. What we can comprehend is how it, it is indeed working our luminaries, our realm, and our earth events. So this is the reason that they lie about flat earth. Take away the construct and you take away the truths. And that's about all I have. Thank you. Okay, for this part of the video, I'm going to talk about and overlay some of Walter Russell's work. Some of you may be familiar with his work. What I'm going to do here is show you how Walter's work actually overlays into our research as did Nikola Tesla's. I want you to pay attention to his diagrams and wording. I have looked at Walter's work in the past and thought it was pretty amazing, even though I didn't understand most of it, but still since doing APM research, I've come to recognize and realize exactly what Walter was trying to visualize and portray. Even taking it further and creating his own inventions based upon his work. Walter is a man clearly ahead of his time, like Nikola Tesla. Walter Russell wrote that the cardinal error of science is shutting the creator out of his creation. Russell never referred to an anthropomorphic God, but rather wrote that God is the invisible, motionless, sexless, undivided 
and unconditioned white magnetic light of mind, which centers all things. God is provable by laboratory methods, Russell wrote. The locatable motionless light which man calls magnetism is the light which God is. He wrote that religion and science must come together in a new age. Very interesting wording, and I would agree. The cube and the sphere are the sole working tools of creation. Walter Russell, 1959 I want you to pay attention to this particular design Walter has drawn because it is very relevant. We have proven the validity of our concept by making a simple small scale working model which is now supplying all the heat, light and power needed for our four storey 52 room university. Our reactor generates much more power than needed for whatever purpose intended. So enough of that surplus is taken off from its generator to motivate the reactor in perpetuity. 100% over unity free energy. Construction of one cycle of an electric current. Notice the heat and the cold. These can be reversed also, as we'll show later in the video. The evolution of mass from plane to sphere. Something else that you're going to learn about later on in this video. The generation of mass and the degeneration of mass. Something else you're going to learn about in this video. This image on the left should also be very familiar. And the Walter Russell periodic table of the elements which will actually make more sense this way up. The winding of the cosmic clock spring. Notice how it places cold at the east gate. And take note of the spiral which we'll be decoding shortly. The unwinding of the cosmic clock spring. Notice fusion is the winding and fission is the unwinding. Okay, for this part of the video, I'm going to take you to the heavens and we're going to decode what the stars really are. For this demonstration, we're going to use a recording done by Richard Coggins on YouTube. It's uh, the it's Polaris, and he recorded it with his GoPro. Now, for those observant people among you, you will notice when recording the star trails, there are small stars which are immediately followed by larger stars. This pattern just keeps repeating so eventually you don't see any of these small star trails because they've been overrun by the larger star trails. Unless you vary your recordings on your time lapse perhaps. The end result of course being many circles. Many, many circles in fact. Aren't these star trails amazing to look at? They really are. And now there's something even more special, as you're going to find out in a few moments. Okay, and now for the decode. Our stars, or our star trails, what you're really looking at are vertically stacked particle accelerators. I want to use six here in the overlays. Obviously there's many more so when we get around to counting them we will add more and uh, give it a bit more realism. But for now here's a simple decode of what stars really are. They are vertically stacked particle accelerators and you're going to see how they play a very big part in the workings of our realm. These halos are 32 smaller nodes and 32 larger nodes, 64 in total per halo. I have only added 6 halos per area here, but you get the idea, nothing is to scale and more research is needed to locate just exactly how many circular star trail type projections there really are and their locations. The star halos are creating motion and a pressure system, spiralling pressure waves into our realm. Pressure changes we record daily are caused by these processes. They are used to compress our sun and generate heat and discharge cold. Mainstream labelling of sun dogs is close to the truth, however. 
they will not elaborate on what the ice is forming on. The nodes of the halos are in the path of the displaced cold, hence then become invisible. You are still looking at the projection. This is also taking place below us on the physical model that is projecting these amazing luminaries and our halos. Our seven planets, as they label them, all go through the same process, the seven golden candlesticks. The star halos generate the winds and our precious systems that take place four times daily. Don't polar vortexes make more sense now? I'm pretty sure now they are the origin of shooting stars or meteor showers that can be timed to certain months. The months they have been more noticed for their heavenly workings. Walter Russell's table of elements will also fall in this category with every halo that is going through the epicycle rotations. The word gravity actually relates to pressure. The forces exerted by our star halos are on our seven planets. The forces required to put them in their various states of sphericity to do their desired purposes as they cross our realm. Walter Russell's table of elements will also come into play here. The halos are all converting elements into matter by design. The halos themselves are not actually rotating, it is the actual particle flow inside the accelerators. The particles that are flowing and lighting up nodes which are all timed events in this very big mechanism of amazing technology. The Creator's glory revealed on a scale we are only just beginning to comprehend. No wonder it was hard for them to describe all this in scriptures. It is on such a grand scale it is hard to see the big picture. But that big picture has been revealed in our research. We had to make a model to see what we are working with and what it actually looks like. We called this model the angelic particle matrix due to our decodings of what angels really are. Particle accelerators and up to 144,000 of them sealed below is what it decodes scripturally to us. The halos nodes, 32 small and 32 large, 64 in total per halo, are also related to the Antikyperian mechanism. It contains many related 64 cog gears, thus showing time itself is based upon the angel accelerator's flow of particles around its halo, not to mention our constellations in the heavens and our major luminaries. Every one of those stars is a part of a particular angel's halo. Imagine that people, our clocks are timed by one revolution of a star halo's accelerator. Isn't that something? A full rotation of the star halo takes 23 hours 56 minutes, but we seem to be missing 4 minutes to make it 24 hours. However, Perhaps time itself was originally 64 minutes based upon the 64 node halos, thus making the full rotation of an accelerator's flow 24 hours, the missing 4 minutes now being located and the Antikyperian mechanism now making more sense. So, how does it work? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me introduce you to ecliptic expansion. You can see with this demonstration how it actually relates to the East Gate, the Sun or any luminary for that matter coming into our realm between the tropics of Capricorn and Cancer. And then they start going into the what I would call the maximum compression zone at the center. That is uh, our smallest star halos, that's where the maximum compression would be. So on a, in a 3D model, I'll just let it play and... This is what it relates to in our model. And how it works with the gates. Charge and discharge, ecliptic expansion and mass. Now the mass they speak of is related to the light and its journey through ecliptic expansion into a compressed ball of light. The compression is being caused by our star halo's rotations, all working together to achieve this very amazing process. With this animation I'm going to show you just how it works. We'll head over to the east gates and watch a sunrise 
that comes into our realm via the east gates. As you can see our sun is in the ecliptic expansion area and has thus not yet achieved its compression from our star halos that is needed to compress it into a spherical looking object. As it enters the compression zones you will see how it reacts to the electromagnetic vortex of pressure waves it now comes under from our star halos. The maximum compression taking place below the smaller halos around the centre of our map. The sun then gets to the west gates, goes back into ecliptic expansion, is shut down and then sent on its return path in the underworld back to the east. So, the spiral decodings now make more sense I hope. The spiralling of electromagnetic vortexes from our star halos. The ancients everywhere in this realm depicted the spirals and this is what it relates to thus confirming the ancients knew exactly how all this works, as our research keeps showing. Left hand rule, right hand rule. Don't those whirling wheels in scripture now make more sense? Don't those windings in the sky have a more special meaning now? The golden ratio is directly related to the workings of our angels, the Fibonacci spiral, the motions and forces caused by their accelerators. Our research looks directly for the cause and so far it's been pretty much on form and gives us many explanations for worldly events as our previous videos have been showing. We have been transparent in our research and given data, events and even proofs as in the case of the sun halo and its nodes. No one is explaining the cause of all this, they say there are anomalies but never explain the cause. To reiterate, during ecliptic expansion our luminaries are in the fission state, whilst inside the realm under the forces of our star halos they are in the fusion state. We knew all this in ancient times, we understood all this, we knew exactly how all this worked. The spirals are the language of angels. The technology that is directly responsible for our luminaries, our wandering stars and pretty much most of nature itself. Our ancestors depicted this everywhere. Every nation in this realm has depictions of these in geo, petro and hieroglyph form. The language that unites everyone in the realm as we were all taught the exact same thing. Then somehow we forgot all this. But we will learn all this again. This cannot be kept hidden. After all, it is the way of the world. Here is another easy decoding. The snake chasing its tail represents the perpetual flow around the accelerator. This is what creates the spiralling flow of energy into our realm from our star halos. This also applies to all accelerators. Horizontally positioned ones below are what create tornadoes. Remember, we are in a duality of technology. Okay, so let's talk about meteor showers for a moment. From the earliest of times, humankind has noticed flurries of meteors that seem to emanate from specific points in the sky and at particular times of the year. These flurries are called meteor showers. They are produced by small fragments of cosmic debris. It produces large amounts of small particles which will eventually spread out along the entire path of the comet to form a meteoroid stream. We will see this stream for a few days at roughly the same time each year producing a meteor shower. So they appear to radiate from a single point in the sky to an observer below. This is called the radiant point. Meteors seen near the radiant are approaching the observer and will appear as short streaks in the sky. Meteors seen 45 to 135 degrees from the radiant are moving in a more parallel direction towards the observer. 
These meteors will produce long streaks in the sky. Those seen in an excess of 90 degrees from the radiant are actually moving away from the observer, and their path will again shorten the further they are from the radiant. Okay. Meteor showers are usually named for the constellation in which their radiant lies at the time the shower occurs. The Perseid meteor shower peaks about August 12th every year. It will appear to radiate from the constellation Perseus. Perseus. While the Leonid meteor shower peaks about November 18th, it will appear to radiate from the constellation Leo. The meteor showers reoccur each year. In some cases, they have been recognized for hundreds of years. Sporadic meteors are those random meteors not associated with any particular shower. For meteor observers, those located in the northern hemisphere have a distinct advantage as shower activity is stronger there than it is seen by observers located in the south of the equator. The reason for this is that most of the major showers have meteors that strike in areas located far above the equator. As it's seen from the northern hemisphere, these meteors would appear to rain down from high in the sky and in all directions. From those situated in the southern hemisphere, only a small percent of this activity is visible. Any activity would appear to travel upwards from radiant located in the sky. There are a few meteor showers best seen from the southern hemisphere. These would include any radiant with a declination below negative 20 degrees. And those that reach the maximum activity during the southern hemisphere months go between July, August, and September. Nearly half of the year's visual meteor activity is crammed into a two-month interval. This is between mid-October to mid-December. It is nearly continuous period of heavy meteor activity. The Meteor Data Center lists over 900 suspected meteor showers, of which about 100 of those are very well established. Particular attention should be noted to the time and the moonlight conditions. All of these showers are best seen after midnight. Some are not even visible until after midnight. Now, showers that peak with the moon's phase being greater, which means it's more than one half illuminated, will be affected by the moonlight and very difficult to observe. So, while, each, while the time each shower is best seen remains much the same every year, the moonlight conditions, as we know, change considerably from one year to the next. So, also, a fireball is another term for a very bright meteor. Generally, brighter than magnitude 4, which is about the same magnitude of the planet Venus as seen in the morning or evening sky. A bolide is a special type of fireball which explodes in a bright terminal flash at the end, often visible with fragmentation. Now here you will notice the meteor showers I plotted are usually very close to some of our six large halos. This is no coincidence. In air, free electrons in a gap form background radiation and are accelerated by an electrical field. As they collide with air molecules, they create additional ions and newly freed elements, which are also accelerated. At some point, thermal energies will provide a great source of ions. The increasing elements in the ether and the ions rapidly cause regions of the air in the gap to become electrically conductive in a process called dielectric breakdown. Once the gap breaks down, current flow is limited by the available charge in the electrostatic discharge or 
by the impedance of the external power supply. If the power supply continues to supply current, the spark will evolve into a continuous discharge called an electric arc. This can occur in solid or liquids, but the breakdown mechanisms are much different for this when it occurs in gases. The heavier parts or other stuff ejected more violently are what we see in meteors. Do we have any evidence of such halo activity that can relate to our grid, the underworld and the realm? Of course, I'll take you back to a few clips from my very first video on this subject where I tried to highlight this some time ago. Notice in this clip our moon shape. Definitely not spherical, but a rather flat looking image of light. But notice as it passes the camera's view it then takes on its spherical form in the reflection. It was in ecliptic expansion and is now taken on its spherical form. You will remember our sun and its halo. You can see here the true sunrise of our realm. This is our sun halo rising from below ground. Node 1, Brahma, our sun projection node, is just off screen to the left and node 8 is on the right. The full halo isn't showing in this clip. Notice in this clip the visitors are clothed in special protective suits whilst enjoying a moonrise. The energies around this plasma type light it must be quite harmful close up. This information places the new Maya Free Station at the East Gates. The Ascension Scriptures mentions is this process, the Ascension of our Luminaries. Our Star Halos nodes can be viewed from two perspectives. At distance you will notice they take on a pentagonal pattern whilst overhead they take on a circular form and again when passing they show the pentagonal pattern again. What you are witnessing are the sides and underside of the nodes attached to the halo. The halo is not visible as we sometimes see with our sun's halo which mainstream call a sun dog but the same rules apply. Although these are much larger accelerators they all share the same build design each one playing very important roles in our heavens and worldly workings. I hope this explains why you see the patterns changing and gives you new information to ponder whilst recording and viewing our luminaries yourselves. Fantastic recording and information Sandra, a very nice capture indeed. Sandra is going to be doing more experiments and research on our star halos. We have a few ideas Sandra will be testing and we will be giving update videos on the results in a future presentation. You can see the shape of Sirius change as the star halo rotates in the heavens, giving Sandra a few different perspectives of this node as it goes about its journey. Our star halos contain 64 nodes. There are 32 small and 32 large. Not all of these are visible or lit up, but they will be noticeable by occlusions and other visible phenomena while eclipsing other stars in the heavens. So, our 64 node star halos, the number 64, a multiple of the number 8. While we are on the subject of numbers, Here's some more very interesting information. At the center of the angelic particle matrix is the Nazca Sun Cross. The Sun Cross is an 8x8 grid which is fairly common in ancient depictions. You can find it on chessboards, mandalas, and all sorts of things. What does it mean though? One possible answer might be found on the Aztec Sunstone. The sunstone itself tracks the motions of both the sun and Venus. The outer ring shows two feathered serpents, each filling half of the ring. The feathered serpent represents the deity associated with Venus, or the morning star. The feathered serpent was known by multiple names. Quetzalcoatl, Viracocha, Kukulkan. 
The deity was said to be as wise as a serpent, but as gentle as a dove. He also had a second form, and appeared as a white-skinned man with a beard. He was considered both a prophet and a healer. The similarities to Jesus are striking, but not a topic for today. The two juxtaposed feathered serpents show Venus's cycles, first seen in the morning during one part of the year, then as it is seen in the evening during the other half of the year. The two opposing cycles of Venus are shown on this outer ring. The ring around the center of the sunstone shows the 20 days of the Tolkien calendar, which ties the sun to Venus. The middle ring shows the wheel of the year, and this is where we begin to see our 8x8 connection. The ring is divided evenly by eight arrows, so that the year is divided into eight equal parts. We also see the year divided into eight parts by eight pagan cultures. Holidays fell on the two solstices, the two equinoxes, and also on four days in between. The last four were the fire festivals. So far we have seen that the wheel of the year was divided into eight equal sections. This gives us one of our eights in our eight by eight grid. The other eight is found in the cycles of Venus. If you were to see Venus rising in a certain location this morning, Venus would appear in the same location in exactly eight years from today. Eight years times eight holidays per year gives us eight by eight. The layout of the sunstone conforms to the eight year epicycle of Venus as seen from Earth. If you overlay the sunstone with the pattern of the epicycles of Venus, they match almost perfectly. The ancients knew this. Research suggests it was known all over the realm. For this part of the video, we are going to take a look at these images from Walter Russell's work and factor them into our model. You can see from their design and locations, they play a very important part in our grid. They are switching mechanisms. When placed correctly, they will play a part in the positioning of our sun and possibly other luminaries. The seasons can be answered by this switching. It seems they are what places the sun in the correct paths to actually create our seasons. The gates in the east, you can see align with the tropics of Capricorn and Cancer and having the equator at the center. Our wandering stars are using epicycle motions as they cross these areas. The same epicycle motions recorded by Ptolemy and the same epicycle motions we see with the sun dog halos as we see them in time-lapse photography. These locations also answer more questions regarding magnetic anomalies that are recorded in various parts of the realm. These are the locations we would place them, and as you can see, the mimic map signalling also confirms the signals are coming from these areas. You can see from the scale of this, we're going to have to think bigger. Much, much bigger. This is a bonus decode clip. Mission STS-134. In this mission patch, notice the atomic symbol, created by three halos. Each containing a luminary, also notice the ISS follows one of the paths. Mission Atlas Free. In this patch, I want you to take notice of the free flames from the engines going through the halo. The actual name Atlas Free and the Sun and the shuttle being on the same path. Apollo 14. Again, pay attention to the free bars going through the halo and leading to a star. Mission STS-129. Notice again the free bars now in red, white and blue. Also take note of the diamond and circle design. The star and again the ISS is linked in this depiction. Let's modify this so we can use it as an overlay to use over our map and grid. Now you can see the North Star, the red shift and blue shift with the white light being the manifested light. This is the Holy Trinity. The union of the free which creates light. Or our sun or any luminary out there. Its colour and role depending on which particle and configuration is used. The luminary being created by ion and frequency injection into Atlas, which means a toroidal apparatus. The smaller halo within the larger halo. Or Ezekiel's wheel in a wheel. 
this is how a luminary is created. This is the Holy Trinity of nodes 1, 2 and 8. Hi everyone, I'm Rose. I joined APM because, to my mind, it's the closest explanation to what our realm is and the most in-depth cross-referenced research I have found. My own research is compatible with this way of decoding the plane and now I have eyes to see the Creator's glory. I cannot stop seeing it everywhere. In this clip we are going to show you how the sun returns to the east in the underworld has something very special that takes place. If you can remember from the 12 gates presentation, the sun returns east through the 12 chakras. Something that was missed at first was when was then decoded later has now been added to reveal this amazing event. Please take notice of the light in this image that it is attached to the solar boat. Now remember, Ra is switched off and being rejuvenated. Isis, Ra's mother, is caring for him and nourishing him back to life. It decodes what this means in reality is that Isis has what we will call a pilot light. It projects into the heavens to show the sun's return path back to the east, coincidentally. The path it returns back via the chakras also matches the ISS path perfectly, which also match events recorded on the mimic map. What you are witnessing is the sun's pilot light, Isis, not the ISS in the heavens. This also decodes as Mary, which we must assume is doing the same role for Jesus as further research reveals in the wiki. There are other similarities in other scriptures of this type of family relationship, a relationship that we decode as technological events between various parts of the sun's halos nodes. The reference to Mary is due to the translation in Latin of Stella Maris, which translates as Star of the Sea, which is first applied to the Virgin Mary in the manuscript tradition of St. Jerome's Latin translation of the Omnimastication by Euberus of Caesarea. A closely related expression, morning star, is referenced in Revelation 2 28 and also in Revelation 22 16. Jesus Christ God claims himself as being the morning star, that is also the gift he had from God, the Father to be rooted in any winner in the faith and perseverant in the works according to his law. As you can see people, our research is revealing a very intelligent creator who has created a realm which can only be described as a technological masterpiece, a construct beyond our comprehension as our ancestors found and tried their best to describe. You will also notice we are decoding geoglyphs, petroglyphs and hieroglyphs. The reason for that is because they are telling the exact same story, the only difference being the descriptions of the angels and this is due to their varying roles and different looks in different geographic locations. They are still part of the same mechanisms that give us our luminaries and a great many other things. A construct designed and maintained to the highest standard with the most ornate descriptions one can possibly imagine. We hope you enjoy our research and information and that it helps you see and recognise there is a creator their glory being revealed in a way we did not expect to see, let alone find. We fully accept this and look upon our realm with new eyes and knowledge, a knowledge that seems to have been lost yet is depicted everywhere in sacred geometry, scriptures, geoglyphs, petroglyphs and hieroglyphs. How did it come to be that we have forgotten all that was once known everywhere in our realm? I'll leave you with that thought, so until next time, it's goodbye from us.